when is the best time for the therapy to begin? Well, it will begin, in fact, in the first moment that you meet the patient, although I understand in emergency situations that you may not meet them until they're in theatre. As Pradeep is showing here, there are often delayed presentations, and this will provide you an opportunity for a pre opt conversation. In this, you may want to start to understand the current requirement for the limb. As Barbara has mentioned, this is vital that we should find out what the patient would consider a good outcome to look like, as this may inform a number of your subsequent decisions. This conversation is much more than just a politeness, as we know it can have a great effect on the easing of stress that the patient feels, it can help them to manage their expectations, and it's a time when we can prepare them that even as soon as the day after surgery, there may be some movements that will be asking them to start, which will help to get their limb working again. There's good psychological evidence that this conversation, if well managed, can even reduce the pain that the patient feels. When you're in theatre, um, if you can consider the important movements of the hand when you're citing repairs and wires, this will help to facilitate mobilisation and ultimately improve the outcome. Please be aware that you may be the only person who knows quite how secure your stabilisations and repairs are, so please be very precise with your post-operative instructions. Um, instructions like standard tendon protocol are almost meaningless in these complex injuries, so it would be much better if you could explain something like immediate passive flexion of MCPJs, active IPJ flexion only from 72 hours. Even if it's even better if you can explain this to the nursing staff or the family who'll be looking after the patient, because if they don't understand it, then there's no chance it'll be able to happen accurately. When you're casting to stabilize a fracture, please cast them sparingly so that the surrounding jo joints aren't inhibited. It's common to see a wrist fracture with a plaster extend right up over the MCPJs, and this leads the hand into the more non-functional intrinsic minus hand. So um, also consider this if you can in relationship to elevation. It's a great way to reduce swelling, obviously, and therefore reduce the chance of stiffness. So if you detail that in your post-operative notes, and if you can send them back to the ward like that, it'll be more likely um, to continue to happen. Immediately post-op, as Tanvir was explaining, there are some structures which are more likely to be spared. So the prone supinators of the forearm, forearm are common ones. And if there's no other reason why they sh you shouldn't move these, Please encourage the patient to start immediately, even if it's only through a small portion of their normal range. This has a great effect both on the patient psychologically and in reducing the rate at which their strength is diminishing. The black and white images I've got here are just to demonstrate that for almost all movements, there are a number of different ways to perform them, and this can alter the force that's needed. So all of these illustrate shoulder flexion, but remember, if you ask somebody to do this, there's a number of ways to do it. So you could place the hand on a stable surface like a table and then move the body backwards. You can lean forwards to allow gravity to assist you, or you could sit or lie down and let the opposite hand assist. In the last two instances, they've got a number of good effects, but also they help to keep the shoulder muscles active and the opposite side, opposite hand helping has good effect in reducing the cortical remapping which is happening at this stage um, to remind the brain the sequencing that's required to get the shoulder moving. And this is especially important if there's nerve damage as it can be a really big effect where the patient almost abandons the affected limb and starts doing everything with the other side. Equally important in the presence of nerve trauma, if the muscles just are not able to move a joint, it'll be important to demonstrate some precise passive movements. And I say demonstrate most deliberately, as it's not the same as explaining it to the patient. There's a significant difference. If you haven't seen a patient do something, you don't know if they can. So please ask them to show you their exercise or their stretch. The position of safer mobilisation is, of course, what we're all aiming to get the patient resting into, and as Tanvir has illustrated. Um, of course, it's not always possible. In the presence of significant swelling, even on a perfect splint, the hand will tend to back out of the splint and head towards the less functional intrinsic minus position here on the right. If you have a dorsal free flap or something that you don't want a strap cutting into, as you can see here on the strap with a star on it, um, it's fine not to, not to put it on initially, but as the days progress and as the flap becomes more stable, I'd encourage you to use the bandaging further down the dorsum of the hand so that the patient will rest safely into this and get a stretch. 
I'd also say please don't forget the thumb, as Anush and Pradeep have been illustrating, it's a vital part of the hand, and if when you're placing it you can cast it gently into opposition of any remaining digits, you'll be able to maximise its function. And finally remembering that these are often used as resting only splints, so please remind the patient when they do their exercises to take them off. So for timelines, I've chosen here some of the most common reasons why we might not move the joints. And it's important to plan for these when you're considering your surgical options. It may improve the overall outcome if we can consider moving the joints around a well-stabilised fracture, maybe immediately. If you're using a free flap, as Barbara had mentioned, you could consider maybe the benefit of citing an anastomosis in the forearm rather than in the anatomical snuff box, and therefore we could get the wrist moving a little bit earlier. Um, if you have a flap and you can consider quilting um, the stitches at the back of the graft over the wrist, then potentially that could move the days that we could start to immobilise the wrist from down to three rather than five or seven days. So even small wins like this may have a significant effect on the long-term function for such traumatised limb. We're commonly asked which is more important, the flexors or the extensors. And I would agree that the role of the flexors and grip is so important that we should prioritise them. But I'd also invite you to be, be a bit more creative now about the ways that you can start to rehab one surface without completely abandoning the other. In these complex injuries, um, damage doesn't sit neatly within the tendon zones, and so it may be more useful to consider them according to their general attributes. The distal flexors, the zones 1 and 2, will tend to have a tenderness repair and more likelihood of an FDS and an FDP adhesion on each other. But we know that only four to six millimetres of glide between these two reduces the chance of adhesions. So from very early on, if we could consider, say, a small hook active IPJ flexion, and then separately a small MCPJ movement, we could do that without overstressing any extensor tendon repairs. The images here are of some of the more innovative ways that tendons are currently being rehabbed with good results. These are all simple splints, and they can be made easily from any casting material or plaster of Paris. Um, but I should emphasise that they're being trialled in the presence of a good strong repair, so a Kessler 4 strand or something similar. Here images A and B from Henry and Hal 2019 show the relative motion splint for a flexor tendon repair. And here the patient will be allowed to start some light function and the repaired tendon is protected due to its position of relative flexion compared to the other fingers. On the top right here, we've got a picture of the short dorsal hood that's been used in zone one and two flexor tendon repairs. And this allows um, us to re-establish the natural wrist synodesis and therefore reduce the chances of, of adhesions. More proximal tendon repairs will tend to include stitching into muscle bellies. And although this appears to tolerate resistance sooner, they're thought to be more friable in the initial instances. So you may wish to limit activity if you've that, uh, that case. For extensors, the more distal zone appear to tolerate immobility well if they're held in full extension. But by zones four to seven, again, it seems best uh, we get the best outcomes if we can re-establish the glide and use a relative motion splint. Something like this that you can see in the bottom right-hand corner sits the injured finger in about 20 to 30 degrees further extension compared to its neighbour. And it's been used for one or two finger repairs with extensor tendon repairs within zones four to seven and seems to be having a really good outcome with no increased risk of rupture.